I'm Marty Cohn, and this is BCTV's Meet the Candidates, a series that affords you the opportunity to hear from the folks who are running for elected office. Today, our guest is Trevor Barlow, an independent candidate for Vermont governor. Welcome. Thank you, Marty. So I got to tell you, um, you know, I, I, I went online to, to try and find out all about you. Um, found out a lot that I, that I didn't know, but I want to give everyone an opportunity to, to hear directly from you. Why the heck are you running for, for governor of, the, of the Vermont? Well, I, um, I moved back here a little bit ago, originally from Springfield, so grew up, went to school there. Uh, had lived around the country and frankly around the world for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently I was out in Denver, Colorado. Uh, moved back to kind of uh, give my children the Vermont experience as I saw it during my childhood. And so, uh, yeah, so we moved back. We bought a farm in Proctorsville and are renovating it and just trying to live the proverbial Vermont life. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason for jumping into the gubernatorial race was that after having you know been here for a while now, as I realized the Vermont of my memory is no longer the Vermont of the present oh. uh, when it comes to the small towns, specifically in southern Vermont, um, that used to be you know hubs of industry and innovation. And now a lot of them are struggling to regain their footing. Uh, you know, decades past when kind of things uh, changed with regards to the industrial side of the equation. So, uh, what I would like to bring to the state as governor is to rejuvenate the southern part of the state and kind of pick up off the um, the example of the northern part, which is to try to make sure that we uh, create innovation centers and really play on that, uh, I guess, not only frugality, but uh, ingenuity of Vermonters to reboot the economy down here. And uh, yeah, and that's why I decided to get in the race because I didn't see that being adequately addressed. So you, you felt in terms of watching over the last few years that that, that wasn't happening and you had a, a certain vision that you could bring people together to accomplish that. Exactly, exactly. Fantastic, and and it's really the fact that that you're that you've jumped in, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. So as far as Thank I'm you. concerned, without an election, you you've still won. I mean, you just, you. just by yeah. doing that, and it's also a great example for your for your kids. Yeah, it's it was wonderful to actually have them be a part of the process. You know, we went up to Burlington and spent some time on the mall for efficiency's sake with regards to gathering signatures and and teaching them here. This is, you know, having them know on a visceral level like this is your dad cares about this and really wants to not only do it for the state but also for them. So so what, what what I thought would be would be good is I, I went on your on your website mm -hmm. and um, you you lay out a number of issues that are important to you, mm -hmm. and let's just talk about those issues that, that sure. you've laid out because I figure these must be important if they're on your website. Exactly. Okay. So not in any uh, particular order, but the order that you had them. First thing is education. You you yeah. say that schools are the lifeblood of our town, no matter the size. What, Correct. What, what do you think needs to be done? for education in Vermont? So having uh, two elementary school age children and having uh, been witness to, I guess, uh, some of the process for Act 46 and attending school board meetings and just talking to community members, um, I think we, we hamstrung our small schools by one, uh, taking away a lot of the local control with regards to the way the supervisor unions are being structured and kind of the force consolidation, uh, which to me is the antithesis of Vermont <laughs> and, um, because it's always been uh, very proud of its local control and local communities. And then I think the loss of financial control uh, is devastating. And the fact that you have towns that, I guess I'm not a very regressive thinker when, uh, in my approach to problems. Uh, because I see this amazing asset that's been there for you know centuries um, for some of these schools that could be revitalized as well as um, leverage to draw more people uh, into the state because we definitely have an issue with um, regaining population in the southern part of the state. So, 
So that's kind of one of my biggest concerns is seeing how, I know how sometimes it can be hard to roll back things, so I'm not right. going to say that, but just how can we approach and restructure Act 46 to return some more control um, back to localities so they don't feel like they're marginalized, as well as figure out unique ways to leverage these community resources um, that ties into some of my other thoughts on our platform, but um, to leverage these community resources to create more value to, like I said, attract more people to these communities. Great, very, you know, something that's really important for, for, for our economy as well. Next issue, health care. You know, yeah. this, this is an issue not only important in Vermont, but clearly it's a, it's a national yeah. issue as well. You, you, you feel that we can, we can lower costs? Yes. Wow. So, uh, you know, obviously health care is this giant beast, <laughs> as well as uh, an economic force. And so I'm definitely a fan of innovation, free markets, as mentioned at the beginning. But I think there are things we can do better because I think health care is one of the foundational elements of a um, compassionate society. And so uh, as far as lowering costs and getting back into the schools, and I, I just recently read an article about this happening, is using maybe schools as community health centers mm. as well and um, having them be dual purpose so that we can have uh, or leverage existing healthcare workers there in the schools to provide preventive and mental health care, which I think is a big challenge, not only here, but obviously nationally. And I think if we start to leverage some of those resources, we can find economies um, within that to lower costs. And, and um, you know, it, I think the bigger picture is not something that can be solved in just a few years with regards to healthcare in general and how we approach it. But I think a good first step would be saying that let's take care of our young and our older um, population and give them somewhere where they can go where they have guaranteed care and they can go. And if they need to be funneled out to more extensive care, okay, we can do that and then let's address that after. But I think it's been proven over and over that if you have a good preventive care system, mm -hmm. then you can lower costs inherently and uh, offset some of those costs for the more, I would say, sophisticated care, which tends to make up the majority of costs in the healthcare system. So the school, the, you, utilizing the schools kind of like as a triage also and, and exactly. also doing more preventative health because exactly. that's really going to save us money exactly. uh, as well. So that leads into your, your third uh, on, the, on the list, mm -hmm. affordability. Vermont can be more livable, livable for all. How? Yeah, so pretty I'd broad. Like to, I'd like to hear that <laughs> pretty, one. Pretty broad statement. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, great state, great lifestyle or potential lifestyle if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, some of the some of the challenges out there that I've witnessed, especially when it comes to housing, I know affordable housing is a challenge, not just in Vermont, but all over the country. Uh, one of the ideas I've had is to uh, give tax credits to those that um, are willing to put their housing stock into the affordable market mm -hmm. so that we can encourage what I would call humane housing. I'm not talking about putting people in rundown, um, you know, below code type housing. I'm saying let's incent people to do good. I'm, I'm more about carrots than sticks. Sticks are necessary sometimes, but I think the carrot would be let's give you a financial incentive to open up the affordable housing pool. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, you know, I think we have to start looking at wages. I know there was some interesting news that came out today about how the um, median income of Americans has actually risen. Uh, obviously, a lot of debate on um, what the actual factors were that caused that to happen, because right now we have a mix of obviously some change in fiscal policy. Um, at the federal level, but as well as some um, localities around the country and states that are enforcing uh, minimum wages for, uh, let's, let's just call it affordability, sure. um, for lack of a better word right now. But I think that comes into kind of the compassionate humanitarian aspect of we're the wealthiest country on the planet. We have plenty of money and I'm not saying I'm stealing from the rich to give to the poor, because right. I know that makes people nervous, but I think we can all have an honest and frank conversation and say, there's some things we can do that we can do better where, you know, those that have and have succeeded, great, wonderful, 
those who have not quite gotten there, let's figure out ways to help them out because I think when you look at, once again, similar to healthcare, it's a preventative aspect of how you build a stronger society. Well, and I think also going to another point you made, if, if Vermont becomes more affordable, we'll be able to attract more people to, to come here and that, that exactly. will definitely enhance. Well, one, one of the other ways to, to bring people here, um, you have down internet and innovation. Internet yes. has been something that uh, I think every gubernatorial candidate has talked about, you know, yeah. and, and w yeah. what, what, are you, what are you gonna do that's uh, <laughs> different? Different. <laughs> different, well, I think um, from personal experience, so as I mentioned earlier, bought a farm, I um, have run a software company for going on 11 years now, have been in uh, telecom and, and on the cutting and bleeding edge of technology for many years now. Uh, and so I bought a farm thinking I'll have wonderful space, I'll have great internet based on conversations I had prior to purchase. Well, I'm looking at you know five plus years later and I still barely have an internet connection, uh, let alone cellular service. So um, I think there's, there's a fine line um, between expectation and reality right now because of the rate of innovation in uh, broadband technologies. So what I would like to do and what I've heard from some of the community broadband initiatives is help them through financing and funding to get off the ground. Um, because we need to lower our deployment costs when it comes to the cost per mile of whether it be fiber or whether it be getting into tower coverage, which is opens up another can of worms I think with Act 250 and just being able to get access to people. but. I think there are ways that the state can help um, that have a business logic behind them. So we create a fund and say, here's the deal. If communities are coming together with business plans that can be based on similar models to EC Fiber or even looking at Vermont Telephone, or we'll work with anyone to get the job done at a lower cost. But a lot of these upstart initiatives, um, like any startup, they can't access funding readily. Right. They can't go into the public markets because they don't have a track record, they don't have a model. And I think if the state says, we will act as that entity, knowing that the demand is there. I think as you know, you talk to any Vermonter, you talk to any real estate agent who says, I bring a family into this state and show them this beautiful property that their eyeballs are, you know, like, this is amazing. and. Uh, and then all their kids jump on their digital devices and there isn't a connection, that is not a good thing. So I think it's still gonna take time because that's reality, but I think there are some things happening federally as well as things we can do at the state level to finally juice it and uh, get over the finish line, but not be so, um, I guess, tied to a particular solution, whether it be fiber, whether it be wireless with the 5G um, technologies that are coming online actively right now, those things can get it done. It's a matter of helping with the financing. Okay. Now, the, the next issue, uh, mm -hmm. I think, is if I, if, I was, I'm, <laughs> if I had done an alphabetical order, this would have been right up there. Yep. Agriculture. When you think about Vermont, it's an agricultural economy, an agriculture state. Mm -hmm. We're hearing about farms closing. This is an important issue. What, wh yeah. what, what do you think needs to be done to, to make sure that our farms and our agriculture are vital? Uh, so I think this is probably one of the most complex issues <laughs> uh, when you get into it. I know I myself bought a farm with the intention of using some of our land to do farming. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been experimenting with that as we go. Uh, I am uh, lucky enough to have grown up knowing farmers as well as um, count farmers as some of my uh, best friends currently. And they're all just, they're struggling. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the dairy industry, well, it's the milk markets, and unless you're in a higher value product like cheeses or yogurts, which I think we can help with, but um, I think once again, the state needs to be more proactive in assisting um, beyond cooperatives and saying, hey, how do we help you uh, with a variety of things from an agricultural perspective, whether it help with marketing, uh, market access, uh, the you know the brand of your product whatever as well as this plays into the internet and innovation side as well 
where if we can help them with automation and kind of take what has typically been a very manual rural process and find efficiencies so that they can gain more margin, I think those would be great starts. I additionally um, think that the emerging market where I think we've missed the boat, and this comes from my Colorado experience, is with the cannabis market as well. Um, you know, here's a high value product that probably for the next 15 to 20 years is going to be one of the most valuable agricultural products in the United States. Uh, we should be on the forefront. I think we need to get away from the fear of recreational aspects and look at more the medicinal and once again playing into the innovation mm -hmm. theme. Uh, there are things we can do to help our farmers diversify their crops, to make more revenue, to get more intelligent and data driven uh, about what they're doing, as well as help once again with the financing just to make sure that we're not losing this precious resource. As well as I think we need to step back with regards to, I think a lot of farmers feel like they're being scapegoated right now. Um, with regards to some of the water quality issues in the state. Right. And um, I don't think that's necessarily uh, true that they are the main <laughs> cause right. of these issues. Right. And so I think we need to revisit some things there as well. Well, it's, it's hard to imagine a Vermont where we're not going to see the um, black and white cows. on Exactly. The, on, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you. Know, and that's something that we definitely need to, to, to look at. Small business development, in order to, to drive all the, a lot of these, a lot mm -hmm. of these things, small business development. Um, our smaller towns and municipalities need help. All right. So, you know, there are good things happening, starting to happen. I think you see the the seeds of change being planted. Uh, I know the. Um, development in Bankton right now, which is uh, finally, I think, gotten a go ahead for some financing. You know, there are a lot of empty storefronts in our downtowns, and I know when I was growing up, that certainly was not the case. Um, there were a lot of uh, local uh, businesses on a smaller scale where, you know, it, obviously we're in a different uh, world culturally right now, but I think. Um, we need to remind not only our youth, but uh, people in our communities that you know, running a small business is a way that you can make a decent living and provide, as well as somewhere in Vermont where I think most of the Vermonters I grew up with weren't out for necessarily fame and fortune. Some have achieved it, thankfully, mm -hmm. for themselves, but I think they're just looking for a good life for their families and to be able to have a nice lifestyle. And so I think once again, we can work to incent small businesses through creating these innovation centers. So uh, one of the ideas I'd like to look at with regards to restructuring our kind of how we fund things in the state is creating kind of similar to venture capital model, uh, collaborative public-private partnership for investment. There's been a little of that done. Um, at the state level, but I think we can do more and scale it up to where we say, here's the deal, we're gonna create eight to 10 regions in some of the, you know, what have always been the uh, anchor towns, we'll call for specific counties, and we're going to create million dollar funds for each area. Right. And say that in order to access these, these funds, you need to give us a 10 year plan for revitalization, and the majority of these funds have to go towards uh, businesses that we think can gain traction and help attract populations um, to our state. And so I think inevitably there's some technology plays that can be done uh, to bring people with the with the bandwidth we do have, right. it's phenomenal. Right. <laughs> it's better than what you can get in most urban areas. Um, but you need to kind of, like I said, bring that fresh blood in to help with innovation, as well as um, existing Vermonters who are f struggling and feeling like they need a break to kind of, you know, that inflection point to get over. And so I think if we can provide the services or improve the services that are existing and say, here, we can give you access to funds we can give you access to training and help you to establish a business that, knock on wood, um, will have more chance of success than failure. Now, do you see these these funds as being grants or loans? That I, would make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think you can do it both ways, mm -hmm. and I think there needs to be a mix. I think the um, I know from having dealt in small business and tech innovation and um, for years now is that. Uh, there's something to be said about grants. It's great getting free money, but 
I think if you're going to give grants, then you need to have stricter protocols to say there's no such thing as free money. Right, right. <laughs> there needs to be a return. This right. is an investment. Right. Uh, but I think on the flip side, if we could give low interest loans, uh, I think that would help to spur things. Uh, I know it already happens a little bit, but if it's in a public-private partnership where I say, for example, um, we're going to dedicate a million dollars to a region as the state, and here it is, here, here are the terms around what we're going to call our innovation fund and engage the private sector and say, hey, we need you to either match or do more than this to, to help spur this. Uh, let's work together, but I think the, the beauty of the state involvement is the state can have a higher tolerance for risk. Sure. Um, and try to, similar to um, my other example with, uh, with lending and kind of supporting, it's a similar model of saying, we will help to de-risk these investments. We're not saying that allows us to be foolish with the, where the money is invested, sure. but let's put down typical solid business protocols. Let's encourage innovation and creativity. Let's also understand there will be a rate of failure Right. And it will probably be significant, but that's okay because it's part of getting the engine started again um, till you find the things that stick. Sure. As well as, like I said, helping these communities that I think a lot of them are still struggling with long-term planning and saying, you have incredible strengths from your history or from your present population that need to be leveraged. We'll help you to figure those out so that you have your unique niche, your marketable niche, or something that we know helps to drive revenue. But um, you know, let's let's support you in getting there and putting a good plan. So, and that's like I said once again, if the state is proactive that way, it helps these smaller communities. That you know, a thousand dollars is a lot of money. Sure. <laughs> if all of a sudden you told a region, here's a million dollars, you don't get it as a blank check. Right. But this is an assurity that we're putting together for you and saying, let's take some risk together to find what it is that really gets things moving. Now, now, have you thought it through in terms of who would admin, is there an agency that currently exists that would administer that, or do you see the creation of, a, of another agency to? to well, that's people? where, so that's where I think the, I'm still sorting that part out, to be honest. So uh -huh. I see on one hand, I, I don't want to create bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. Right. If we can leverage it through um, an existing uh, aspect of state government, great. But I also I believe strongly in pushing down to local control and saying, here, we're going to give you the guidelines. And yes, we're going to do some oversight, but we're not going to be overbearing. This is meant to say, yes, this is a risk but we're all in this together to, with a, you know, an outcome in the future. So um, as far as getting into that, I think I would, I would prefer to have oversight be within a public-private partnership right. that involves local people on the public side, obviously the people we're trying to encourage to innovate, as well as the private sector that hopefully will see that energy and, um, and take off with it because I think they're best equipped to kind of drive it in the long term. Now, the, the, the uh Next issue, uh, mm -hmm. very key, the environment. Um, you, we are great stewards of the environment. All right, what are we gonna do? So I think that's one of, the, it's happening right now, obviously. There's the state initiative to revisit Act 250. And I can remember going back to my childhood of that being a source of pride when um, Hydro-Quebec was happening, and I remember being up at some of the meetings and being able to watch it as a school kid and saying, wow, this is amazing that we've empowered Vermonters to really be stewards of their their own environment. Um, and, you know, I guess I grew up with the business big and bad. They just want to come in and destroy the environment. Well, I, I don't think that's the case anymore. Right. <laughs> and frankly, I don't think it's the case the majority of the time. So I think we need to look at um, once again, with regards to small business innovation of saying Act 250 is important. We need it. All Vermonters care about their environment, but we also know that Vermonters need to be able to take care of themselves as well as we need to have the economic flexibility to bring more people into the state. So on that note, I think with regards to taking care of the environment, we have water issues that we need to address. We have aging um, systems and infrastructure with regards to um, sewer and water. I mean, it's painful to see the stories about the um, 
you know, Lake Champlain issues. Uh, and so I think we need to address that. State needs to get involved. Like, we need to figure that out. I'm not saying the money's there right away, but there needs to be a plan where we all agree that, hey, this is what we want. Um, I think also we need to look at a state trail system. So, and incent landowners who have done a great job. I know the vast system is an amazing asset right now. And we have the fruits of um, all of these bike trail systems or multi-use trail systems that are happening. Escutney, Kingdom Trails, uh, you know, Pine Hill and Rutland. But I know in traveling around the state and talking with a lot of people who are outdoor recreation enthusiasts, no matter what it is, biking, hiking, hunting, you name it, uh, I think if we once again incent landowners and say, similar to affordable housing, if you're willing to allow your land to be put in use for these uses, um, for public access, so we can create a statewide trail system that's a draw for tourism, then we will incent you economically. We'll, we'll similar to agriculture, we'll say you have a benefit. Trevor, anyway. a, lot of, a lot of great ideas. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I wish you luck. If people want to learn more about you, what's your website? Yes. So it's uh, Trevor4, the number 4, vt.com. Okay. But if you look up Trevor, F-O-R, Vermont.com, it all redirects to that as the main site. Okay. So. That's fantastic. Um, the general election is on Tuesday, November 6th. Please vote. I'm Marty Cohn. Thanks for watching.